Hey there, good morning everybody. It is the 11th of May, 2021. It is a Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, and we are here to continue our study in the book of 1 Samuel. We're in chapter number 20 today, so if you want to turn your Bibles there with me, you can read along, and that'll be extremely beneficial if you'll do that. Let's pray together, and we'll jump right into it. Father, we love you, and we're thankful for this book, not just 1 Samuel, but the Bible. What a blessing it is to have in our lives. We're so fortunate. And as Jesus told us, to whom much is given shall much be required. I pray that we do our diligence to read and learn and study this book together. Even one chapter a day, day by day, adds up. We pray you'd add the knowledge to our memories. We pray that you'd give us the instruction from what we know. And we pray that it would develop into wisdom as well. We love you this morning. We thank you for the book. We pray your blessing on our study. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. All right, so as we know, tensions have been ratcheting up between Saul and David, and today they come to a boiling point. So it's a bit of a long chapter. I didn't check the number of verses yet, 42 verses, not as long as I thought, but uh, we'll get into this and we'll see what transpires. Verse number one, 1 Samuel chapter 20, and David fled from Naioth in Ramah, And came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? David is absolutely perplexed as to what's going on, what's happening, why Saul hates him so much. He cannot figure it out. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had someone just absolutely hate your guts and you have no idea why? (laughs) I'm grinning nice and big because I have. I mean, I've had people just absolutely, in fact, one day everything is fine and the very next day completely flip that thing upside down and man, I tell you what, they hate my guts. They didn't want to kill me. Maybe they wanted to, but they didn't make any attempts at it. But uh, it's the strangest, most bizarre thing ever. And you have no idea why. And by the way, the book of Matthew, chapter number 18, Christ tells us how to handle problems with other people. And the way you do it is by going to them and saying, hey, you know, this is what's upsetting me right now. And you hash it out. You know, most people in your life are good people who just, you know, we, we sometimes get angry with each other and we put walls up between each other because we didn't stop to just slow down and have a conversation and we let the emotions get the best of us. But anyhow, David's here and he's thinking, man, I do not know why this guy hates me so badly. What have I done? He's asked. And the truth is he's done nothing. This is all in the heart of Saul, and that's another lesson to take away from this. You know, sometimes when people are acting crazy or out of sorts, it's because of what's going on in their own life or what's going on in their own heart. And so we can't worry about that. You know, if if you're behaving like a, a madman because you can't manage your own emotions, I got to be honest with you, I got a life to live and I got stuff to do and I got people that need me. I can't tend to your immaturity. And that sounds harsh, but you know, that's what God said back in chapter 15 and 16 of First Samuel. Uh, we preached on it Sunday night. Chapter 15 tells us that Samuel was mourning for Saul and chapter 16 Verse 1, God says, how long are you going to mourn for this guy? You know, eventually he has to own up to his own actions and choices and decisions. And so you need to you figure this all out. And and so God does that. He says, you know what? If you want to act like a, like a baby, then you're going to have to do it on your own because there are other things I need to give my attention to. And so realize that, you know, you don't have to take on those people's baggage. You know, that's their burden to carry. Now, if you try to help them with it, you try to work with them, which is a noble thing and a good thing to do, but if they're not catching on, then, you know, they're going to have to figure it out in their own time. Verse number five, I think we are at. No, no, verse number two. And he said unto him, so this is Jonathan speaking back to David now, God forbid, 
Thou shalt not die. <clears throat> Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will not show it, or that he will show it to me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. So Jonathan's trying to reassure David. He's not going to kill you. My dad tells me everything, whether it's a big thing or a small thing. He doesn't keep it from me, and he's not going to kill you. You're going to be fine. Verse 3, And David swear moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. So David says, Jonathan, I appreciate your naivety and your sincerity, but because he knows how you feel about me and the friendship that we have, he's not going to want to grieve you. So he's not going to tell you this. If, if your dad wants me dead, he's not going to let you in on it. So now they're disagreeing here about how Saul would handle it. Verse four, then said Jonathan unto David, whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. So Jonathan says, okay, what do you want from me? How can I help you? I'll do anything. And David said unto Jonathan, behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go that I may hide myself in the field under the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. And if he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? And so David puts forth this plan. He says, hey, let's do this then. Let's say that I've come to you and I've asked if I could leave and go back to my father's house in Bethlehem to offer a sacrifice. And I'll be gone from the king's table. He won't see me. He'll wonder where I am. He'll ask you. And that's what you tell him. And I'm just going to stay hidden in the field here for a couple of days. And we'll see how he responds. If he responds favorably, then we know that I can come back and it's all going to be fine. But if he loses his temper, then I know I'm in trouble and I need to stay gone. And then he even says, and look, you know, I don't want to go through this with him. I'd rather have you kill me here and now than be killed by the hand of your father. You and I, we have a covenant together. We've made our friendship, uh, a relationship even known to God. And I'd rather have you do it than me have to face your father. Verse number nine. And Jonathan said, far be it from thee. For I know certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon me. I'm sorry, if I knew certainly that evil were determined uh, by my father to come upon thee, then would I not tell it thee? He says, look, if I knew for sure my dad was going to kill you, I'd tell you. Then said David to Jonathan, who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? So now they're going to figure out how to get the news to David about how his dad responds when he's gone. Verse 11, and Jonathan said unto David, come, let us go out into the field. And they went out, both of them, into the field. And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow any time or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and then send I, send, then I, and I then send not unto thee, and show it thee, the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do the evil, then I will show it thee. And send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with thy father. So now Jonathan makes another promise under God to David. And he says, look, if I find out that my dad wants to kill you, but I don't tell you about it, then I pray that God would kill me alongside of you. 
But if I find out that my father's okay with you, then I'll get you news and you can come on back. Verse number 14. And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And so Jonathan makes this sincere promise and even covenant to God. It's like a contractual agreement, but with God involved. And he promises David he's going to take care of him. He's going to take care of his household and his family and so forth. Verse number 17. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. And when thou hast stayed three days, then thou shalt go down quickly, and come to the place where thou didst hide thyself when the business was in hand, and shalt remain by the stone easel. And I will shoot three arrows on the side thereof as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a lad, saying, Go out, find the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, Behold, the arrows are on this side of thee, take them. Then come thou, for there is peace unto thee, and no hurt, as the Lord liveth. But if I say thus unto the young man, Behold, the arrows are beyond thee, go thy way, for the Lord hath sent thee away. And as touching the matter which thou and I have spoken of, behold, the Lord be between thee and me forever." And so Jonathan comes up with the second part of the plan. The first part is that Jonathan's going to tell his father that David has gone home to sacrifice. And so that's why he's absent. And if Saul says, okay, that's not a problem, good for him, all is well. But if he blows his top and uh, decides that he wants to kill David, then David has to be let known what happens. So the way they're going to let him know is David's going to hide in the field. And after the, that conversation happens, then Saul, or I'm sorry, Jonathan will bring him, himself and his servant to the field, and he's going to shoot arrows. And if he shoots arrows to a certain side and the servant runs and fetches them, that means the coast is clear, David. My dad's okay with you. You can come on back. If, however, he shoots beyond the servant, and he says, hey, the, ser the arrows have been shot further than you. Go get them. That means, David, you got to get out of here. My dad's not happy. So let's see how it goes. Verse 24. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. And the king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day, for he thought something hath befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. And so here Saul has this negative outlook on David. There's no reason for it, right? David has only benefited Saul. He's been a good soldier. He's killed Philistines. He's his son-in-law. He plays music when his spirit is down. David has only been a blessing to Saul. But now we see Saul says, you know what? He seems, he's probably hurt or dead because he's not clean. He's not clean at all. And the one who isn't clean is the mind of Saul. And, and we'll get into this maybe as we wrap it up today. But you need to be careful about your own thinking and the perceptions that you have about circumstances and people. I'll tell you this, it's really easy for us to get off in our thinking. In fact, the devil wants to mess with our minds. And sometimes the devil's not to be blamed. We're our own worst enemy. When we're pessimistic and negative and we're contrary and we lack faith, these things hurt us. In fact, the New Testament says, uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. And the way we do that is by feasting on the word of God, 
meditating on it, keeping it in our heads. The Bible is the very mind of God, and so it needs to be in our minds as well. But you, you got to think uh, with a Christ-like mind. Another passage says that we're to cast down imaginations and every evil thought that lifteth itself up against God. You know, you, sometimes you get a thought in your head like, I don't think that guy likes me. Well, you know what? Get rid of that thought. That's a ridiculous thought. I mean, you know, either find out for sure or don't go down that road. You know, if you, and that guy, I don't think that guy likes me. Then go ask him. Hey, you know, sometimes you and I, we seem to have a little bit of a difficulty getting along. Are we all right? Is there a problem between you and I? And if they say, no, no, sorry you get that impression, well, that clears it all up, right? Or if they say, you know what, you got a point, I can't stand you. <laughs> well, at least you know. And it's not an imagination anymore, and you don't have to worry about it. But it's this mystery constantly. Uh, or when we see someone do something or say something. You know, it, this happens in church a lot, and it's something I really work hard about. But sometimes I give an illustration, and I'm truly pulling it out of thin air. And and I don't know it, but I'm actually describing what's going on in somebody's life in church. And I have no idea that that's happening. There's so many people there. How am I to know what's going on? And they'll even come to me afterwards and they'll say, you know, were you preaching directly to me or at me? And I'll say, I don't know what you're talking about. I was not. And they'll say, well, here's why. And they'll lay it out and I go, wow, I had no idea. I, you know, I just made that up off the, the top of my head. And so it's better to ask than it is to just guess. Oh, they did that because they're trying to do this to me. You're not going to get anywhere with that mentality. First off, you should be busier than having time to sit around worrying what everybody's thinking about you. We don't have time for that. The world's dying and going to hell and the devil is running roughshod to and fro through the earth. Our, our nation is losing its collective mind and we're worried about whether or not somebody's trying to spite use spite against us. There's more important things to consider than that. Anyway, let's get back on track. So verse number, I don't know where we are. Oh, he, he says uh, he thinks David's not clean. Verse 27. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cameth not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? So David's been out in this field this whole time waiting. It is, so Jonathan didn't come out and shoot the arrows after the first day. He's probably thinking, what's going on? Verse 29, And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee. For our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother he hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. And so that's exactly what he and David had planned to say, that David had a sacrifice back home that he was being bidden to come to, and, uh, that's, and Jonathan gave him permission to go, and that's why he's not been around. So how does Saul respond to this? Verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, so he's not responding well. And he said unto him, look at this, wow, thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I don't know what all that means, but it's not good, is it? Uh, I mean, in our vernacular, the, the lost world uses terminologies uh, like this. Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman. He is ripping Jonathan's mother here, and, and clearly Saul has some issues with Jonathan's mother. But uh, boy, he says, you're on David's side. That's basically what it amounts to. You're on David's side, and I don't like it. Verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now, send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. So Saul is trying to manipulate Jonathan here. Saul knows he's losing the kingdom. 
If Saul loses the kingdom, that means it's not Jonathan's either. It's going to leave the household of Saul. See, if it went to Jonathan, it would still be established under the throne of Saul. But God told him that's not happening. So what Saul is trying to do is he's got the idea that David's going to be the next king. He's trying to kill David so that he can keep his throne and also then let his son have it. So he says, as long as you're friends with David and as long as he's alive, you'll never be the king. So he's trying to get Jonathan on his side so that he can turn against David so that he can have the throne. Verse number uh, 32. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? So here's that, that innocent question again. Why are you trying to kill him? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that a, that it was determined of his father to slay David. Yeah, I guess so. If your father throws a javelin trying to kill you, he probably just as soon kill your best friend too. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. Boy, these two. And did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father hath done him shame. And so Jonathan has his answer. David doesn't yet know, but Saul's trying to kill David. Jonathan just gets up from the table and leaves, doesn't even eat. This argument goes on in front of everyone. Abner's sitting here. Jo Saul throws the spear at Jonathan. This is crazy. This is a domestic disturbance. <laughs> and so Jonathan just leaves. Verse 35, and it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him. And he said unto his lad, run, find out now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot the arrow beyond him, which remember was what Jonathan said he would do if David had to leave. And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow, which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, is not the arrow beyond thee? So the the arrows are shot and the lad runs and he's looking for the arrows, can't find them. So Jonathan shouts, is not the arrow beyond thee? And he's saying that not for the lad's sake, but for David's sake. And Jonathan cried over the lad, make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the lad knew not anything, only Jonathan David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his artillery unto his lad and said unto him, go, carry them to the city. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of the place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground, and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another, and wept one with another, until David exceeded. And so David comes out of hiding. He bows himself to Jonathan. He owes Jonathan a debt. Jonathan pretty much is committing treason here. If Saul wants David dead, and Jonathan knows about it, but he aids and abet his escape, uh, then that's just what it is, isn't it? And so uh, here, Jonathan is letting him go. David is thankful and he's grateful for what Jonathan is doing and he's getting ready to leave. Verse number 42, and Jonathan said to David, go in peace for as much as we have sworn, both of us in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord be between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. And so Jonathan and David have to part ways. Jonathan reminds him, hey, this isn't the end of our friendship. We have a relationship that we have made consecrated through the Lord. And even though we can't be together physically, we're not going to be working together. We're still friends and I'm here for you and I'll help you. So amazing truths all throughout this chapter. We've already hit on a couple of them, several of them. Uh, one we didn't talk about is friendship and the importance of friendship. I've heard people say, you know, you don't get to choose your family, and sometimes your family doesn't turn out to be the relationships you need them to be, in spite of how much you might try or work or want it to be, but you can choose your friends, and you can go out today, and you can be a friend to someone. By the way, you can be someone's friend without them reciprocating. 
You can be a friend to someone and they not be your friend in return. And that's okay too. You can just be good to people and help people and uh, serve them and meet their needs. You can even do that anonymously uh, to be a blessing to folk. And so be a friend. Find someone to be a friend with today and uh, encourage them somehow, some way. And then the other thing, we, we kind of touched on it, but I want to get back to it before we sign off here today, is the mentality of Saul. You know, is Jonathan a smart guy? Yes, he is. Uh, is he to be trusted? He certainly is. He said himself that my dad doesn't, he runs everything by me, whether small or great. So Saul knows that he can trust Jonathan. And then is David a good guy? Yeah. He's done nothing to hurt Saul. He's only helped Saul and benefited him. So my point here is this. When you feel like something's wrong here, something's not quite right, or your thinking isn't right, but good people see things differently than you, then you might want to trust those good people. You know, if, if people you trust lean one way, but you're leaning the other, you might want to default to them. I heard this statement years ago, and boy, it's helped me time and time and time again. Never make a decision when your decision maker is broken. You know, there are times when things in our life aren't quite right, where maybe we're discouraged or we're depressed, maybe we're fighting a battle. Uh, things are crazy, and we're not always thinking right. Well, you know, when we find that we're in that headspace, we're in that mentality, we might want to just slow down and not make any big decisions. In fact, make as few decisions as possible. And if we see that people we love and that we trust who love us and are on our side are, are advising us differently than we're thinking, we might want to trust them and their thinking. What I'm saying is Saul should have said, man, if my son Jonathan says David's a good guy, there must be something wrong with me. There's a, there's a couple stories here if we got time. I guess we do have time. We take all the time we want. But one is the, uh, the story of the, the grandpa laying on the couch uh, asleep. And his mischievous grandson runs up to him and he rubs some Limburger cheese in his mustache. <laughs> You know, Limburger cheese doesn't smell all that good, I'm told. So he runs this, and he, so the grandpa, he's sleeping, but he smells that cheese and he wakes up and he says, boy, this couch stinks. And so he goes to uh, the chair on the other side of the room. He says, I'll sleep in this chair. And he gets to the chair and he smells and he's still smelling that cheese, but he doesn't know. He says, boy, this chair stinks. Uh, and he, so he goes to another chair and he says, boy, this whole room stinks. I'll go to the bedroom. I'll lay down. He goes in the bedroom. He still smells it. He says, boy, this, this whole house stinks. I'll go take a walk. And he leaves the house and he's walking down the sidewalk and he's still smelling the Limburger cheese. He says, man, this whole world stinks. And of course, the one who stunk was him. <laughs> it wasn't the couch or the chair or the bedroom or the whole world. It was him. And sometimes when we think the whole world stinks, it's not the whole world. It's us. One last thing. When things aren't going right in your life, you might behave unusually. You know, like for instance, if your house catches on fire in the middle of the night, it wouldn't be unusual for you to run out into your front yard in your underwear. However, if your house is not on fire and it's the middle of the day and you're running around your front yard in your underwear, it's probably you. <laughs> You've got the problem. So what am I saying? Saul, when he looks at the life of David and the threat that David is, he's running around his yard in the middle of the day and his house isn't on fire. He's overreacting about something that's not a reality. And so many times, you look at the, the way our culture is working today in the United States, it's called cancel culture, it's called woke culture and all this stuff. And, and to be fair, you know, society and humanity has always had issues and they've always had problems and it's the sinful condition of man. But when you're saying that things like Dr. Seuss books need to be recalled because I don't know why they even talked about recalling them. Uh, there, then there's something else. Oh, a Snow White was given a non-consensual kiss by the prince, so we should get rid of that. Uh, the, the whole thing. It's insanity, 
is what it is. It's people running around their yards in their underwear in the middle of the day. And by the way, if they did that, that would be perceived as normal. That's how backwards their thinking is. Anyhow, we're at 30 minutes and I'm not going to keep you any longer. Thanks for hanging with me. As always, like, love, share the post. God bless you. Have a great Tuesday. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Three, two, one, 30 minutes. See you later.